I'm here to do a very, very short introduction to our guest tonight, Will Alsop. Will uh, studied uh, in London at uh, the AA. He worked with Sherry Price. He was uh, with us uh, in the past, uh, 2004, for a lecture on Cedric when uh, there was the exhibition out of the box. He is uh, active uh, in uh, different areas, from architecture to uh, urbanism and painting, which more or less are the same thing for, for Will Alsop. He's now teaching uh, in uh, Vienna. And uh, just uh, to remind uh, two buildings, uh, one is the Peckham Library in London who got the uh, Sterling Prize in the 2000. And in the same year, I think that you started to work for the Toronto uh, building, which also uh, won an uh, um, Architecture and Urban Design Award in, in Toronto. So I'm mentioning the, the two prizes, one in uh, London, one here. Uh, there is a, a, an exhibition in the octagonal room at CCA on the, this project. There are some drawings, some paintings which uh, are coming from CCA collection and which were a gift of uh, uh, Will Alsop to the CCA. Uh, I would like to stop here and I would like to remind you that there will be a small reception after the lecture. You can join us in the Shaughnessy House. Please join me in welcoming Will Alsop tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mirko. You gave the first slide away. <laughs> it's okay, it's not your fault. I know that you're technically challenged. <laughs> Good evening. It's very nice to be here again. And as Mirko mentioned, this is the second time I've stood in its exact place um, to address an audience. Last time was to my great friend, employer, mentor, um, to talk about Cedric Price. And it was very frightening to do that, because it's much easier to talk about me. I know more about me than Cedric, of course. And um, although Cedric is, of course, eternally uh, important to me. Now, I've talked tonight, it's called Street Creatures, and some of it is about street creatures, and you'll understand, I hope, when I get to that, and some is not. We all invent titles for talks, and then you deviate. But I think that's allowed, it doesn't matter. And I'd also like, Mirko, for you to tell me about ten minutes before you think I should stop, okay? I can stop anywhere, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I have far too much. <laughs> okay. Bye. <laughs> anyway, it's very nice to be here and, and uh, in the, in the uh, CCA, which I think is an extraordinary institution, doing a very important job. And there are not many CCAs in the world. And I think that's important that it's here in Montreal. And that's wonderful, really wonderful. So, you've seen this before. <laughs> Now, a little bit about history. I'd like to ask, pose the question to, well, I should ask the question. How many architects in the audience? Put your hand up if you're an architect. Ah, so put your hand up if you're not an architect. Oh, many more non-architects. How wonderful. I hate architects. And <laughs> how lovely. <laughs> And I also wanted to welcome, I know that there are people who come here tonight, I'm very impressed, from Vancouver, from Detroit, from Toronto, a little bit closer. And it's wonderful to see you all, um, and some old friends, and hopefully some new friends. Anyway, I wanted to say, that I put this, this is a blurred image, this is a little bit of history. This is the, obviously the Sterling Gowan building, the engineering block in, in Manchester. That's uh, Manchester, in Leicester. And um, it's blurred because that's the way history is. It's true. You don't see it really for what it is. But I remember when I, I was maybe 16, I was born and bred in Northampton, and I remember being uh, driven, because I was too young to drive myself, 
uh, to go and see this building after completion. And I was really, really impressed. I thought it was fantastic. And in some ways, of course, Sterling, who is very closely associated with this building, you know, there's a large proportion of the archive here. I don't know if it's all the archive, but um, anyway, there's a, a very important part of it here in this building. And, uh, and of course, to, for me, Sterling, it's very easy for us architects today to think, ah, in the past, everything was clear. So these different architects that did extraordinary things and, and pose really questions, it seems that it was easy compared with our task today. But it wasn't. It was just as confused then as it is today. And I wanted to remind you of that. And I thought this is a very clear statement. And I have been to Leicester quite recently, actually. And I've looked at this building again. And it's just as good as it was. And I had the same enjoyment from it as when I first saw it. So it was a very significant, I can't say an influence. You know, I'm not sure that I, actually, I'm not sure that I really care about influences in my work. I like architecture and it doesn't matter when it was made, whether it's the 14th century or the 20th or indeed the 21st century. It all can influence us in unknown ways. There are people that make... So here you have Corb. Last weekend, I was staying in the hotel in the Unité building in Marseille. I went to Marseille for the weekend and it was fabulous. And I, my room in the hotel was half a bay, a bay is 3.6 meters wide, half a bay is 1.8 meters wide, six feet, for those of you who prefer that dimension. It was like sleeping in a coffin. <laughs> but great. But you see, I, I, you, you lie in bed and it's fine, you know, you have everything you need, you have a shower, you have a, somewhere to hang your clothes, you have the bed, you have a desk, and you have a balcony with also a shelf on it so it, it's warm, you can look out. And, um, and of course it's very narrow. I'm quite big, but I was alone. And um, it was extraordinary. But if it hadn't been Corbusier, would I have liked it? You have to ask this question. You know. To what extent are we influenced by history and of course infamous people that actually design some of these objects? And in that particular case, you can occupy that object. On the other hand, I always feel a very close affinity to Corbusier because when he was commissioned to do that building was the year that I was born. I don't know what that means. Probably nothing. But it, to me it means something. I remember looking at pictures of that building when I was probably, I don't know, in books when I was 12 or, or 13 years old, thinking it was extraordinary. I didn't know whether I liked it or not. It didn't matter. I just knew that it was something different, something extraordinary. I didn't understand the intentions behind it. I'm not sure that in reality, if I'm truthful, well, I understand those intentions today because there are many interpretations. And I was in this building with Dalibor Vasselli and Peter Carl, both professors at Cambridge University, and they had many, many theories. And I, 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 went, I flew back to London on Sunday evening and I thought, the theories are all fiction. Interesting but it's not actually the experience, and I just like the experience. Therefore, in architecture, it is about the experience of what we produce. And of course, well, we'll come on to that later. There's some people doing some very bad things in the name of architecture, but to me, it's not architecture. And I'm not sure that this image that Corbusier produced is actually architecture. It's propaganda. But extremely important propaganda at the time it had a message. Here, this blurred image of Mies. The thing I like most about Mies is I think he was fatter than me. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I never met Mies. I think there's some people in this room that did. But the image for those of, of him, that people, for the people that didn't meet him, was he was quite severe. On the other hand, if you talk to people like Peter Palumbo, who commissioned Mies in London for, a, sadly, a building that was, never, um, was, was never, uh, never built, and eventually it was built by uh, James Sterling, actually. Um, and you listen to the stories, and the stories that Palumbo have of, of, meeting, Mies and, of Mies, meeting Mies, that's quite difficult, um, of meeting him and then asking him 
um, whether he would like to take on the commission to design a very complicated building on land that at that time Palumbo did not own. He had to assemble this land with 326 different leaseholds and I don't know, uh, maybe three or four different freeholds in order to assemble the land. And Mies knew, because he was of a certain age, that actually if he designed the building, by the time it was done, it, he would be dead. So he asked Peter Palumbo, how far should I go? And so Palumbo's answer to that, also knowing the implication of the question, was down to the doorknobs and the ashtrays. I like ashtrays a lot, and it's very sad that these things have passed in our society, <laughs> except in Detroit. And <laughs> but I, the point of the story is that six weeks later, this parcel arrived at Palumbo full of doorknobs and ashtrays. He started with the doorknobs and the ashtrays. And to me that shows a, sort of a very human element to the whole notion. It's the relationship, and this is true for all architects, it's the relationship between the client and the architect, which I think is very important. And it's set out in a very good, in a, in a very good way. And it was neither Mises or Palumbo's fault that that building, as designed, was not actually realized. A very small image, I didn't realize how small it was, of the Smithsons, Peter and Alison Smithson. I'm coming on to the, sort of the British side here. You see, this is Robin Hood Gardens, which is in East London, which is about to be knocked down. And I was asked if I would support the idea of listing this building to keep this building, and I refused. Because I, didn't, I think it was a great building when it was built. It had a certain purpose. Today, the whole context of this building has changed completely. It's adjacent to Canary Wharf, a new business center, and, and, and it's not been looked after, and it's, and it's, it's full of difficulty. It would be, it's, it's, a his, it's, a, it's a building which contains some miserable history here. I'm talking by that, I mean murders, robbery, poverty, why would you keep this building if you had the opportunity to get rid of it? In other words, cities change, and cities should change, and it doesn't, the architecture in this sense doesn't matter. And I, I, I didn't really know Smithson a little bit, um, a little bit. I, th I thought he was, I thought his wife held him back, actually, but that's a personal view. And he was really a great person, a very good theorist, I have some issues with theory, but, um, and that was good. But I like to think that he wouldn't have kept this himself. I really don't think he would be in favor of keeping his building. It's a sort of nostalgia. The 20th century society would like to keep this building. And I think it's right to knock it down, and that's what's going to happen. And then there's my old employer, friend, the man responsible for making me fat, <laughs> the man that introduced me to cognac at 8 o'clock in the morning, <laughs> the man that said things that made me really think. I worked for the, he was the guy I first worked for after qualifying from the Architectural Association. I wanted to work for him, and, and I did, because I think it's very important. This is my advice to any students, is that when you've finished at university, try to work for someone that you're either fascinated by or you have deep respect for, because it's actually your second course in, archi in architecture. And I think that's really, really important. You know, that next move, school is clear. You know, you go there somewhere, you, you, you're successful. Um, and you get your diploma or degree or whatever it is, and then you have to do something. There's so many students that go off, and they maybe have the fantastic portfolio. Maybe their final project was the best thing you've ever seen, and then they go and work for someone, and they're doing floor tile layouts in bathrooms. Well, someone has to do it, of course, you know. <laughs> And maybe it's not so bad, but you don't mind doing it if, it, if it's for, really, for an architect you really think is interesting. If it's just some asshole just producing condominiums for no reason, forget it. <laughs> it doesn't mean anything. I've done my own 
labours on tile layouts. Okay? It's like you know, and it was worse then because you had to do it by hand. There were no computers. But Cedric was a great man and a great influence on, on my life. And it was, to a certain degree, an epitome of Englishness, as indeed Smithson was. And Cedric always pretended to hate Smithson, but I think he, in reality he loved Smithson a lot. And Cedric would not have been Cedric without Smithson, because there was this dialogue. And um, I think that's, that's a very important thing to remember. It's very personal, it's very local, it's very local to London. But for me, because I'm standing here tonight, it's very important. Oh, at least we've got to me now. <laughs> I built this building. I don't need all this light, actually. I don't know if someone in the control box can turn that down a bit, because it's quite bright. And I like to be able to see you, because you're very beautiful. <laughs> this is a building called the Cardiff Bay Visitor Centre, which was based on my disposable cigarette lighter. It's true. My client was the Cardiff Bay Development Corporation, and at that time I was w working, and in fact indeed did, the Cardiff Bay Barrage, and I made a big lake where there was um, for a freshwater lake where there was a bay and inlet from the sea. So the barrage itself, which creates the lake, is a mile long, more or less. And uh, my client said, okay, we're expanding, we're doubling the size of Cardiff, going south, to, and reconnecting it with the water. And we, therefore, we need a building where we can explain, not in, to the people of Cardiff, what's going to happen to their city, but also where and we, any inward investment, we can meet people and so on and so forth. And they asked me to design this building. And uh, before they said, actually commissioned me, they had asked a large firm of accountants for some inexplicable reason to do a feasibility <laughs> study on how many people would come to this building. And it was KPMG. I shouldn't say that. It was KPMG. I hate KPMG. And so it's not an advertisement. I don't like accountants very much anyway. But anyway, they came up with the conclusion that 25,000 people a year would go to this building, and my client, who are lovely people, so thought that was enough to justify the expenditure for a temporary building. So what they didn't know is what that building was going to look like, because I hadn't designed it then. So I did this building in 1989, and in the first year, 450,000 people went. So you can see that, as per usual, accountants are highly inaccurate. <laughs> and I like that fact, that's why I'm telling you. But on the other hand, you say, why did 400? It's a very remote, this is a part of Cardiff that no one was used to going to, because they couldn't get there, it was part of the docks. They were not allowed in there. And I like that because they went because they didn't know what it was. At that time, they'd never seen any sort of building that looked like this. Not at all. So they went not because of the message, because of the unusual. Now, you might call it, icon I wouldn't call it iconic myself. And we know that in the context in which we all operate as architects today, there is a sort of anti-icon movement led by people, that don't, uh, by architects, who don't have the capacity to make an icon. That's my observation. They're inadequate. And as I had an earlier conversation today over lunch, or slightly before lunch, I didn't remember, you could say, you would never say that for a football team, would you? For a footballer, you're too good. We don't want you. You're an icon. David Beckham, heaven forbid. That's what you want. I'm not lightening myself to David Beckham. I have a better taste in wardrobe. But, <laughs> but nonetheless, you have people because there are architects that are really interested in architecture. Not necessarily making things that I might like, but I can respect them because they're doing things which, with a sort of commitment. You know, I love David Chipshaw, uh, Chipperfield. I don't like what he does, but I can respect what he does because he does it with great commitment, and that's fine. I don't like the things in the, ex in the other exhibition here today, but we, may, we might get onto that. But it's well done, so it's all right. I have to say that because Merco's there. 
but because there is room for everything today because it's a very diverse world of architecture that we live in. There is no predominant style, no predominant methodology, no predominant anything, which somehow makes it difficult. You go back to the, some of the heroes that I was talking about earlier. You know, some people think, oh, it's very clear then. It wasn't clear then. They had to work very hard. Um, it's only with hindsight that we see that what they did was extraordinary and, and clear in itself. But they were living in the same sort of murk that we live in today. It's just we live in a different type of murkiness than they did, that's all. At least most people in this room, including myself, we've never experienced war, have we? That's extraordinary. A lot of those people live through wars, the great disruption. We've lived, thank God, in a sort of area of peace. Anyway, this building was done. It was there for five years. They tried to sell it to, um, Sheffield, to Sheffield, would you believe? But the good people of Cardiff said, you can't do that because we've printed postcards of this building, see? <laughs> <laughs> so we were given a new budget. We moved it in one piece 400 meters around the corner, and it's still there today. Much to my embarrassment. No, no, it's, uh, no, it looks okay. I'm proud of this building. But what interests me is being copied twice by the Dutch, once by the Germans, once by another English uh, company, which is now my client, Urban Splash. And I, I like that. I like the fact that it's been copied. Still in the same place in Cardiff, part of the barrage, is this pink hut which is known locally as the Barbie house. <laughs> I'm happy. If people call things, if they name your buildings, it means they've already taken it on board. You know, they, they, they've learned to, to love what you do. But the real point, I put this here, that these small things, going back to the idea of street creatures, they have, can have a huge effect. You don't always have to do anything big. And to me, it's, it's as interesting to do something very small, or this is a, a very, very small part of a very, very large project, to me, the whole point of this, that people walk to it. It's, it marks a point where people walk the mile along the barrage and say, we'll go to Barbie House and then we go back, see? <laughs> Fine. It's actually a yacht start station because they have um, y uh, yacht races here and this is where the umpire or whatever they call those people in yachts do it. It's all in steel. I like that. Some of you will know that I have a great friend, uh, Bruce McLean, an artist, and he and I have been working together for years and years. And uh, sometimes we work on the farm in Menorca, and this is on the farm in Menorca. And this is a piece of the work that we do. It's pure luxury. The work that we do is apropos of nothing at all. No, I, I like that. You know. It's about no idea. And I'm interested in the idea of no idea. But we look around, see what pieces of materials are around. In this case, obviously, in this year, we had some cardboard and we had some plywood. So we made this thing like a stage. But what interested me is this is not a part of the local village. It's some maybe two kilometers outside the village. But from the bar in the village, you can see this. So when you do something that's a cadmium orange, as in this case, they can see it. And people walk towards it. And so when we're working, in the sort of, uh, not so much in the morning as I notice, because then it gets too hot in the day. Uh, oops. And then in the evening, we have our gin and tonic session of working. <laughs> then they walk, and then they talk. And I think it's fantastic. You can do anything you like, but it's something that they haven't seen before, something that is pure research. And some of these things come up again and again from this work in Menorca within the architectural work in, and in other places. And I, I'm... I think it's, that's extreme, but what I'm interested in is these people, they walk the two kilometers. Maybe it's because they know they'll be offered a gin and tonic. Who knows? That doesn't matter. But, and they're very nice people, but they're, they're curious. And I think curiosity is an important part of urban design. And I have to say that I think many urban designers today, some of which might be in this room, I don't know, are intensely boring. There's an attitude that actually normality and banality is what urban urbanity should be. Rubbish. All you do is to create places that people don't go to. 
well, that's another version of the same of the same thing. But you get the idea. You can do it. I like you know, the activity of the architect can be very diverse, and this is working in West Bromwich, which is uh, in the Black Country. I can't. It is actually a part of Birmingham, but locally you can't say that. I discovered that people in West Bromwich which is 20 minutes by metro into downtown Birmingham, they've never been to Birmingham. They say, ooh, I wouldn't go there. It's a dirty place. <laughs> <laughs> they've been to Paris, London, Rome. They've never been to Birmingham, which is 20 minutes down the road. It's unbelievable. West Bromwich is pretty dirty, I have to say. It was bombed very badly in the war, very, a lack of investment, pathetic investment, raped in the late 60s and early 70s by shopping centre developers, and that's it. High unemployment, high illiteracy, many problems. And so I, I got this job. But I started, I did a lot of, I started this project in 1997. It was finished this year. Long gestation period. We had to work to get the money, etc., etc. And I'll, I'll show you, if we get to that point, Mirko, I'll show, I'll show you the result later. But the point here is part of that process is exploring what the building might be on the site. And this is the site, this is the old bus station, and working on that. So, that, well, there's not many people here, but there are a lot of people that come and say, what are you doing? That's the point. And then you engage them in conversation, and you say, well, this is what we're working towards. What ideas have you got? And the relationship between the architect and the general public, who is actually your real client in this particular case, I think is absolutely vital. And how do you do that? You don't do it sitting in your office, inviting them in. You don't do it by sitting at the town hall and having a, you know, a public consultation meeting because it means nothing, because people go to sleep, as you, some of you might do tonight, particularly those that drove from Detroit, 10-hour drive, I can't believe that. And it's about doing something. And the notion of the workshop, where you get the general public to work, not a talking shop, now, if it's a talking shop, it would be called a talking shop, but a workshop is to get them to actually put down their aspirations, ideas, in any form that they like, preferably with, with a pencil and drawings and paint, but it doesn't have to be. Some people feel more comfortable with writing down words. But it's about exposing themselves to each other. I think that's a very important thing of breaking down barriers, going beyond the expectation. And in my experience, what I've found is that people on the whole, are really, interestingly, mad. The politicians and the planners don't believe that. But I've, I've talked to them and I said, but you haven't done what I've done. You haven't gone out and made them work and, and, and worked with them. And give them, you know, give them wine, give them beer, give them coffee, whatever. It should be a point of celebration. There is a relationship between joy in the final project, whatever it is, and the joy of the process. We are not accountants. We are not doctors who deliver very often bad news. We are not lawyers who get all their money from other people's problems. We are architects. And we peddle joy. That's why people don't like to pay for it. You know? Because it's not miserable. You know. But there are a lot of architects out there who make it miserable because they get more money. But small things. These small things. So in Valencia, uh, we were working, and we had this notion that we could do a department store. With, and department stores, funnily enough, have departments. So you have the smoking department. Not very popular in North America, but quite popular in Spain at the time, or the drinking department. Still popular in North America, but can be problematic in New York. The sausage department. This rather large man, who is the, uh, his name is Bep, and Bep lives on the island of Menorca, and assists Bruce and I in our work. He's like a tank. You know. He can lift anything. He's an extraordinary man, but he also makes sausages. I thought, ah, here's the man to lead the sausage department. 
the Department of Art, this is terribly obvious, and the Department of Deportment. Only because I like this combination of the words. <laughs> but it's the fashion department, you know, the clothes department. How could you incorporate this? You could argue that cities are like a... Could, you could see them as a department store, couldn't you? And therefore the opportunity in Valencia was to make a place which has these things. So it's a take on the department store. So here it is, look. In the middle is the department of drinking, and you can see Bat with the sort of sub-department of the sausage department. He's the one in the Scottish hat. We got closed down by health and safety for the sausage department, sadly. But on the, on the, on the right-hand side, here is the department of reading, and we commissioned uh, both English and Spanish writers to do short stories, which are printed on the top of the table, so you read the furniture. You have the same story on the underside of the table in case you've been in the department of drinking too much so you can lie down <laughs> under the table and read the same story in Spanish or in English. On the left is the department of dancing. So each of these granite stones on the left is on an individual spring. Then we have professional dancers to dance on a floor. That, so you change one condition which is the stability of the floor and they have to dance in a different way. It was really interesting. I thought it was interesting. No, the, look, there's a crowd there. They liked it. On the right is the Department of Beauty. We had a big puddle of perfume there. So you could look in and look at your reflection. Narcissus. Wonderful. But you could also have your hair cut. And the idea, and uh, we have extended this. I mean, uh, 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 notion for the art gallery in Edmonton which was a competition which we won and then curiously enough we didn't win I've never forgiven the other part of Canada for that um, but you know how do you get people into a dead art gallery and I can assure you that the art gallery in Edmonton is as dead as it comes I went there on a Saturday morning I felt very lonely when at a time when it should be vibrant. What about the evenings? You know, why in White's Avenue, I think it's called, which is only two kilometers away, it's full of people, all doing funny things like drugs and everything. But they were having a good time, but there was no one in this square which had been, in my opinion, over-designed with the new um, city hall, the art gallery, the library, everything around it. So it was all textbook stuff. This is what you have. There's no, no one there. Cities should be grubby. But it seemed to me that within, the, within this place, you should take the existing gallery, break it down, turn it into a ruin, and then you have things like the Department of Hairdressing. Because hairdressing is actually an art. It would be wonderful to go to the hairdresser with friends who had been in the Department of Drinking and say, Greg, let's do a new haircut tonight. <laughs> And you take the artiste of the hairdresser who comes out with a wonderful creation. It doesn't matter, it will grow back. <laughs> it's about engaging. You know, there are many forms of art which are often misinterpreted by curators, in my opinion. How long does a piece of, uh, of, uh, of work last? Not long. Great fun. You make something and then you burn it. And everyone enjoys every part of the process. So time, that's where I get from Cedric, is a very important dimension of architecture. And you can have something in this particular case which lasts for four days and is destroyed in two hours. It's wonderful. And no one gets hurt. As here too, as part of my brief tonight was to show you some things I'm doing now, as well as old stuff, and this is about something I'm doing now, which is looking at factory-made housing, in other words, cheap. Looks actually a bit more luxurious than Corbusier. Many applications, student housing, cheap housing, affordable housing, although, of course, given the current crisis, maybe all housing will become affordable. Who knows? Um, 
something has to change and I don't want to get into that particular argument but it's very for us it's very good it's very direct it's very necessary and uh, we enjoy looking at that and something that we're doing or again questioning the idea of the museum who of you have been to Frankfurt now, out of those of you who've been there who enjoyed Frankfurt <laughs> oh look there's no arms went up at all Extraordinary. You were about to put your arm up <laughs> and you realize you're in the minority. I think Frankfurt is possibly the most boring city in the world. And they didn't want to be. They had an idea. They had an idea that first that they should become maybe the financial hub of Europe. They had that possibility. And then they, th they did have the intelligence to know that if you're going to do that, then you have to have culture as well, because to, uh, for the banks to attract, um, well, to attract, uh, well, if you attract the bank, then you have, the banks have to attract staff from around the world, and they have to relocate. And if it's a boring city, they won't go. So they, but in my view, they built all these museums. And museums are somehow the kiss of death, aren't they? I mean, museums are interesting, and archives are interesting, but if you have lots of them, it becomes very boring. I blame Richard Meyer for this. But it's not time out, it's time in. And I think that's a very important thing to remember. If you want to transform your city for whatever reason, you want to get people on the street, not in the museums. And there's just an oversupply of museum in Frankfurt. Here, this is in the middle of uh, Wiltshire in southern England. And in those sheds, which are actually huge, is everything that belongs to the Science Museum that they can't show in the Science Museum in Kensington in London. There are wonderful things here. And actually, and going around in these sheds, which they have to do something because some of them are falling down and it's not a good place to keep some of these precious objects. But they do open it to the public from time to time. And I, to me, it's more interesting to go around these sheds than actually the Science Museum. Because the problem with the Science Museum is they thought they'd better come into the modern world. So they go to <coughs> specialist consultants who design presentations in museums. You know, oh, we must be modern. You have to press buttons, do you? Now, when I go to the Science Museum in London, I see more children standing in front of some huge steam train from whatever year, standing there in wonder. The, the buttons are boring. The objects are fantastic. And here in the middle of this you know, is the plane. You can stand by the plane that... Uh, God, what was our Prime Minister who, went, who flew to Munich to, uh, to speak with Hitler? Chamberlain. Thank you very much. And you look at this plane, and he went to, to Munich for the day... You can explain anything. I, I wouldn't go to Munich for the day. I wouldn't go anywhere in that plane. <laughs> but that's fascinating. I mean, it's, it was, it's tiny and it looks very fragile. But that's in that shed, plus many other things. And then there are piles of things that they're still trying to make sense of. You know, rusty old motorbikes, but just piles <coughs> of stuff. I think it's very interesting. There's a very loose interpretation. You know, the odd sign here. And everything. It's fascinating. And why is it fascinating? Because you feel that you're discovering what's in this museum for yourself. You're making it up. You're not, be, you're not being conditioned by someone else's idea of what circulation is. And I think that's an important thing to remember. And it applies to cities. And it applies also to shopping centers, you know, which are always overthought about, in my view. But that's something else. But anyway, we're thinking about what you, what, how can you house some of this stuff in this place, and they have this, it's an old airport, really left over from the war. And the idea that we're talking about is that you actually cover, that actually the, the land itself is a sort of museum. There's interesting geology here which you can look into. You can, if you go here, you would have to, for some people, you'd have to stay the night. And you could actually use science and technology to extend the notion of the stay in this particular place. So it's a challenge to you. What is the 21st century sleeping bag? Hmm? I, mean, I don't know the answer to that. But it's an interesting question, don't you think? I can see you're already working on it, sir. <laughs> How you can sleep out 
on these Salisbury Plains here and feel very cosy, a word that architect, most architects never use, cosy. In Deutsch, gemütlich, in French, uh, no, in, um, I don't know what it is. What's cosy in French? Come on, I'm in Montreal. <laughs> there isn't. Uh, in Dutch, is Fuzella. I don't, I don't know, there must be a French. Great, oh, well, I, I mean, I, there are nuances. And not, they don't never quite mean the same, but there's the general direction. You know, that the modern movement gave us non-cosy, didn't it? That's what my mother, that's why my mother hated Peter Behrens. <laughs> it's true. Oh, it's not cosy. We shouldn't be frightened of that. But the notion of lying outside in the 20th century sleeping bag, and it's a little bit cold. I'm not, I haven't solved the problem of how you go to the toilet in the middle of the night, but we, we'll work on that. <laughs> Amongst vitrines in the landscape, where you drag out some of these objects out of the big shed and celebrate them, and you grow certain trees, and that's a part of the research. It would be a really interesting museum. I, I think, don't you? Don't you? Just say yes, please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, move on. Now. <laughs> I like doing bars. This is my gold bar. Get it? Okay. <laughs> this is the bar I designed to make you feel sick so you don't drink too much. <laughs> it was very popular, particularly that mirrored floor. I, I won't go into that. Or in Toronto, this uh, small edifice, which is actually a sales center for a condominium. It's quite popular. It's a small thing in West Queen West, opposite the Drake Hotel, for those of you who know the terrace, which is one of the few places in Toronto where you can smoke, and therefore one of my favorite. And um, it's kind of interesting, because it's, it doesn't, the object in itself doesn't tell you what it is, but it's just there. And people, I'm, I'm interested in that. It doesn't, you can go beyond what is actually known. Let's go outside my work. Let's go to Bilbao. I'm sure that some of you have been to Bilbao to see Mr. Geary. Or just for Bilbao, which I think is a nice place. But it's inland. And there's a river with very few boats on it. And there's, a, there's an area by the, by the water. And another town. I can't remember the name of it. But if you go from downtown Bilbao up to the coast, it's a bit too slow, but it's not bad. It's a couple of hours. You go past through all this stuff, you know, these bales, these silver bales of metal are cars. Fantastic, aren't they? I like that. But in many of our cities, we get, we're getting rid of all this stuff. It's still there. You see, they don't need the building, they just need the place to put the old cars. Good. I find myself looking at these industrial installations, not to go back to the notion of Richard Rogers and, and high tech, because he made all this plight. I think rawness is quite interesting. Look at this. Isn't that a beautiful object? Rather good green, actually. It's quite, uh, cause you can work out, if you look at it long enough, what it's for. It's to get things on and off boats and going into the back. But you know, at first glance, you don't know what it's for. And I think, I think, that's, I think that's fascinating. And I think I predict we'll go back towards a greater rawness in the architecture. Otherwise, we only have David Chipperfield. But at the end of this tour, you get off, and you're thinking about lunch. And here is this man barbecuing sardines, freshly caught. Very sim I like this little building. It's good, isn't it? And it's so good that none of us architects in this room would ever design that, because if we were asked to design it, it wouldn't look like that. It would look like something designed. <laughs> There's a real issue there between design and non-design for me. But more to the point here, you order two or three, whatever, however hungry you are of these things, you have some very fresh lettuce, a wonderful fresh loaf of bread, a very nice bottle of cold white wine. It's the best lunch I've ever had. It costs nothing. 
costs nothing. And I think that's very important. These are the things, and of course, there are all of these benches full of people because they all know you get a fantastic lunch for almost nothing. Very healthy, very fresh, and very beautiful. And that's what we need to animate our streets. If you put this same stall with the same ingredients somewhere in the middle of Montreal, it would be full <coughs> too, except in January, of course. Let me move on. This is uh, a part of Manchester. It's an area called Spinning Fields, and my friend and client has built nearly all these buildings that you can see, and all the ones that are highlighted are buildings that he's built over the last, let's say, six to seven years. Big project. You're looking at um, buildings there. There's, there are two buildings there by Norman Foster. Norman Foster on a bad day, I would suggest. And there's some law courts built by Denton, Cork and Marshall, who are Australian architects. I like John Denton a lot, and actually, it's the best, it's, this photograph doesn't do it justice. It's the best building. It is an interesting building. And um, anyway, my friend, Mike, calls me up, because you know, there's room for another four buildings here and everything. He said, well, can you come up? I'll buy you lunch. I'll, I'll do anything for lunch. <laughs> Good. He said, then we'll, come, uh, we'll walk around the whole of this domain that I'm building at the moment, and then uh, I want to ask you what you think. So we did exactly that. We sat down for lunch. He said, what do you think? I said, well, it's extraordinary that you've done all this stuff, and the millions and millions and millions of pounds that you spent. They're all that. None of them are empty, these buildings. And uh, many offices, I think KPMG are in here. I have to say. And so we sat down, not a sardine lunch, something a bit more exotic. He said, what do you think? I said, well, I think it's extraordinary. But you know, as you walk around, there's no one on the street. And there was, it wasn't a cold day, it was quite warm. And I said, so, you know, you have an opportunity now. I, I, you could argue that it's really boring. You know, it's Norman Fosser at his greyest. He said, well, what do you think we should do? I said, well, you can, there are four quite large buildings still to go. There's all the streets and there's some shops and things that still had to be occupied. And to be fair to him, he has an idea that in the shopping street, the facades of the shops will be, they're not there yet, nine meters high. It's quite good. So then the people, they can put mezzanines in there, but you have a nine meter high facade. I think that's interesting. That's an interesting idea. So he said, what, do you want? He said, what are we going to do about this? So I said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, for some extraordinary amount of money, I'll finish off everything. Okay? Give me two months. I'll come back to you and tell you what I think you should do. You have to pay me for that. If you don't like it, you don't like it. So what I did, I made, you don't know Argos shopping, do you? It's catalogue shopping. But I make your catalogue. This is architecture shopping. And you can order from the catalogue. That's what I did. So this is part of the plan. I won't dwell on that. This is uh, one of the drawings just to get my juices going. What I saw in the street were these Prada skirts. Now, he liked this. We're doing three of these. He gets, a, he gets a discount for four. He should have ordered four. <laughs> okay. But uh, nonetheless, and one's a, one will be a tea room. We have the permission, and so we go ahead. He ordered this building, which is all in, in, in situ concrete, the wall. No glass. Well, there is glass because there are windows, but it's the complete opposite of what they have there, which are mainly glass buildings, because that's what agents say you have to do to, to let. But they're also quite expensive. And with the new regulations for insulation, to achieve those now in the UK, you have to have triple glazing, which is actually too expensive. So why not use concrete? But not precast concrete, which I think is difficult, just in situ concrete. Then I can, you can play with the, with the wall. But more importantly to me, but more having this underside, this undercroft, and this forest of different, like a library of columns on it, which we could then animate, which would contribute to street life. This is my shop. He's ordered this for Paul Smith. 
so that Paul Smith can have fashion shows on a spile around the shop. Small, see, small thing. The other building's quite big, but this one's small. I like the small things. And this means nothing, but it's just quite nice. <laughs> then the shopping street, the main shop, very expensive shops, needs a cover. It rains a lot in Manchester. It really does. It's not a myth. It rains. It needs some cover. So I thought, well, we should do some scarf. Not a roof, a scarf. Oh, there's another Prada skirt, okay? Oh, and, and this is part of the catalogue. There's a Bruce McLean sculpture on the left. You can have one of those, two of these. He's ordered two of those. You can have the, the, the cover over the street. And on the top uh, right is the hairdressers. Remember? <laughs> but in the street. He hasn't ordered that one yet, damn it. But he, but he will. I'm confident that he will. But the scarf should move. And I've been working with uh, my great friend Neil Thomas, the engineer from Atelier One, and uh, as to how to make this, because I don't want to make it in fabric. We make it in enamel steel. So that as it moves, it makes a slight noise. I hope it doesn't make too much noise. We'll see. But he like, uh, there are some columns some, somewhere in this that are missing from this image. I'd really like to be God, so you didn't have to have... You could control gravity in another way, but never mind. Then you have the newspaper bending. See, it's a newspaper, enamel steel. Oh, look, it's open. <laughs> he bought two of those. Very good. Well, that's quite enough of that. There's the condom hotel on the left. <laughs> He hasn't bought that yet, but I'm confident that he will. And two, two more Bruce sculptures. There's the building we've sold on the left, and then the other one which he also hasn't bought, which is a combination between hotel and office. And, and I, there's a big story there, but I, won't tell it, I don't have time to tell it to you now. So we begin to work on the space under the concrete building. Put a newspaper stand there. Oh, I had to go back there. Then he said, oh, there's something that's not in your catalogue. I said, oh, yeah, what's that? He said, I want a juice bar in one of the squares that I've created. So, okay. I like this client because the first thing I produced for the juice bar, quite rightly, he said, you've done that sort of thing before. I don't want that. I want something you haven't done. It's good. I mean, it's really, really good to have a client like that. I like this guy because I think he might take to the church soon, actually. But Look, so this is the juice bar in the square, and it's a clock, and the mouse goes round, so you know the time. Uh, the observers, though, you'll realise that the time is being going backwards here. It's not intended to do that, it's just a mistake. Okay? <laughs> but you can see the shadows as they go around. And in there is a, there's a solid bit with a man or a woman selling juice, fresh I like this man. He loved this. Which is also a problem because I have no idea how to do the mouse. <laughs> but we're, we're working on it. <laughs> there you can see where you actually order it. And then, you, of course, the track also becomes seats and tables as well. What else do architects do? This is me working with at the Royal Academy in London saying to this assembled group of um, they're all um, school kids, from different, all from different schools. But okay, we'll meet at 10 o'clock. By 12.15, we'll have done a big painting, and then we'll have lunch. They never believe that. But at the end, you end up with this big painting. And they're all amazed. And it's not only a big painting, it was quite a good painting, I thought. I thought it was, very, I thought it was better than some things in the Royal Academy, I have to say. But it's about belief. And that's all another role for the architect to say, you can do this. You know, to actually encourage other people to do things. And you have that possibility. And most architects, and I have to include myself to a certain extent, we don't do that. We do what we do, we do what we're paid for, but there is a job beyond what you're paid to do. 
and it's a very enjoyable result. I do the odd station. This is in Stratford, East London. It's all right, it's done. But I think back in the studio, Prouvé, the architect, I'm not comparing myself with Prouvé, who I think was brilliant, but he would only make stuff that he could, he could only design stuff that he actually made, the notion of the prototype. I'm not saying I'm doing that here, but you know, to have an idea and thoughts that actually could relate and be translated into a building. That's exactly what this large piece of paper is. It's cutting into it to see how light and what shadows you can form. Could you make a, the outside of, in this case, uh, a primary school that we've just received planning permission for, could that be used for a school? Can you actually make a, a, a two-dimensional table, pull it forward, become, allows the light in, and also is read as three dimensions? It's part of research. I spend ages in my hut fiddling. You know. Fiddling is the key to everything. Fiddling and diddling, we call it. And the, here is the school. It's called the Faraday School, which, of course, Faraday was a great inventor. But the most important thing, and I've lost a bit of the original concept, I have to say, but it was that you, on this housing estate, which is in Southwark, very, quite a poor area, that it's not, the, it's not the kids that are actually going to school, it's the four- and five-year-old that hasn't gone to school yet. If they pass the school, they should look at it and say, God, I can't wait to go to this place. Most of the schools that I see, you think, oh, heaven forbid, I'm glad that I don't have to go to school yet. You know? <laughs> it's, sort of, it's about sensuality. You could say sex, but, you know, well, I will say sex. You, might, you can call it something else. I did this beach hut, which is on the beach now. It's like an oyster. When you're not using it, it just closes. It's good. Small things are great. This could be one of our sites in Toronto. This is just a clue that Greg and is here tonight and I is working on for a, a new HQ for a, a company. I'm not going to tell you about it because I know there's a lot of architects in this room and you're just going to steal my client. <laughs> But it's a great sight, as you can see. <laughs> That'd be a good building, wouldn't it? Now, here I'm saying, we, we have the project, we have the client. We're not sure exactly what site it's going to be on yet, and it's so subject to change. But I'm giving you something away here. When you have a new client, and you hardly know them, the first thing... I think you do, is you have a, b a bit of a notion, just to, just to kick off. You say, because you make things that fly around, I'm going to put you into a flying saucer. But it's much more than that. But I can see from going around the existing offices that they all need to be on one floor. Can you make an office that is a single floor office? Because they rely on talking, a lot of that, a lot of interaction, serendipity, and all those things. Fantastic. So a single floor does that. And then, of course, if you elevate that, then you could look down on the test bed, which is on the ground. So you get all these helicopters. Is that my mother on the phone? <laughs> no? It would be surprising. She died some years ago. But <laughs> and it might need a few blobs. You know, who knows? But you're... Not maybe the first meeting, but maybe the second meeting. You say, look, here's an idea. Maybe it's, uh, maybe you love it. Maybe it doesn't matter. You, you can hate it. But the chances are that they will love it. Then you can build on that. But of course, if, if we change the, the site, there's no sense here. And also, uh, as you, some of you know, we work very closely with the people who live around these places. But in this particular site, there is no one living there. So there's no one to, to work with. Ah, Shanghai. I've gone a bit further than this. These are a bit out of date, these photographs. This, this bubble you can see is a ferry terminal, and, which is a small part of the overall project. It's quite nice, isn't it? Do you like that? No, I don't. And <laughs> no, no, it will be okay. It's all glass, very, very expensive. You can do things in Shanghai that you couldn't even begin to think about 
in Europe or in North America because it's too expensive. It's because they copy everything. I'm very, very cheap. Here's the whole site. This is going to be the new art gallery. Big, isn't it? 800 meters long, this site. Underneath all this lot is a shopping center. On top, there are uh, offices, a hotel, residential, a park, a big park along the front. It's extraordinary in Shanghai that slowly, as the river goes th through, so we, we, they're building and putting into place at a very rapid rate beautiful parks. And I mean beautiful. They're really good at gardening. And they look after their gardens. You know, whereas in Europe, we have shears to cut hedges. They do it with scissors. <laughs> no, it's extraordinary. And but there's a very fine grain of detail in the, in the landscaping. And there it is again. I seem to have a lot of these. And this is where a tunnel goes under the site that connects the site with um, Pudong. So you can't put any, anything, uh, you can't put any foundations down. So he said, no, but it's important to have a line there. So we, we build this portal. And these blobs... I mean, actually, extremely large bars and restaurants just hanging there. I could, if I showed that to a client in New York, they'd say, great, forget it. Because <laughs> they couldn't afford it. I find that a really interesting difference between North America, or indeed Europe, and uh, China. You can afford to do things for the moment. They don't last forever. That's my initial... <laughs> Um, thoughts for this site. Not the, not the rocket behind, that's by somebody else. Just the bit in front. In Beijing, this is the beginnings of uh, Raffles Hotel, which is not, it's a hotel, but it's also an office block, an apartment block, and a sh of course a shopping centre. This is part of the shopping centre. Quite good, you see. Oh look, there it is. Not so good, maybe. I lost control here a bit, but it's done. You can't stay there yet. There are no bathrooms yet. Well, maybe some people could. <laughs> but back to the small things. Oh, it's not so small. This is in London. I've, I have two planning permissions for this site, so you can see my building. And it, to me, this is interesting. It's part of the city of London, right in the middle. You can see, well, you can locate it. There's St. Paul's Cathedral. And both these, the first planning commission was for banking hall type space, so virtually no columns. Then the market changes, no, no need for that. So then we get a new planning permission for offices for, which could be subdivided, the columns don't matter, and could be let in smaller packages. Market goes for that. Now we work on a hotel. This is my favorite project. It means I get paid three times to do the same project in the same place. I know everything about this place. Okay? And uh, I love my client. And actually, the daughter of my client here is about to marry next year my son. Isn't that a nice story? You remember the Honeywood... Did anyone read the Honeywood file as a part of their... Um, part, well, we have part three, which is the legal bit, you know, case law. I remember it. It's like the Honeywood file. You know, this is a combination of, 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 of romance and hard contractual relationships. <laughs> I have exactly the same relationships with Mallory here. Okay. But I, I like Mallory a lot. He makes me laugh. And uh, so now we go for this. We're looking at this uh, skin that wraps around. We're extending it right over, so it hangs over the river, which is what we did in the offices anyway. I like doing the hotel because we can make a thinner building. You don't have to have such a fat floor plate. And this, I mean, it's still very early days, but you wanted to, I was told I should show some things I'm working on now. This is in, uh, the skin is alabaster, which is translucent. So you get light and then there's some views, maximizing the views of the river. This is just opposite the Tate, uh, more or less opposite the Tate modern. I don't like this, but it will be good when it's done. This is inside, of course. When we come to Canada, this has been, this is Kensington Market. And... We have a sort of client. This is a very slow burn project, I have to say, but I think a really interesting project. The Kensington Market is roughly 17 blocks, very close to downtown Toronto. 
um, a well-formed market, a very strong community uh, who live there, but it's a place that is going to change, inevitably. Whatever happens, it will change because market forces are such that it will change. And of course, if you go in the wrong way, the wrong, they'll just go in and there'll be confrontation, big fights, and the result will always be a compromise. Somewhere. But things will happen uh, under normal economic conditions, I, I have to add, uh, which we have to assume will come back at some point. But it's a nice street. You know? And I like the fact that you know, in most other cities, these cars wouldn't be allowed down the street. I like the fact that they're still there. You know, it's your problem if you choose to drive a car because it gives life to the street. But as I've been working on these drawings, these ideas and thoughts, um, some were used, were, went on an exhibition um, at a gallery in, in Toronto nearly two years ago now, I think. Wasn't it? And uh, that, that's around. But it's just en route to trying to define what this place could be. And how could you redevelop quite a large area without, she, without destroying the area? Uh, to me, that's the fascinating question. Now, what, what can you, you can use the street, you can use the airspace above. Uh, don't take this literally to scale here, this image. Um, you can use some of the open space, you can use the car parks. There's all sorts of things where you can actually introduce new life. And it does, in my view, need new life. It needs, because much as I love Kensington Market, basically it's a bunch of out-of-date hippies who run it. You know. The smell of dope is rife. Well, I'm not complaining about that, but, you know, there are more modern drugs. <coughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> so you develop this notion, they call it urban fog. And an urban fo fog is quite interesting, where you... you you, can't, you deliberately can't read the city clearly. That it becomes difficult. There is this complexity that you can add, which I believe people enjoy. The clarity of reading a city, and this is where I fall out with many uh, urban designers, they try to make things clear, when I think things should become unclear. <coughs> I think that's absolutely vital. Now, I, I can see Merkel looking at me, and I must... I, I, Almost thank you very much. So I'll be very quick. This is called, and this is not my idea, okay? I have a large site in the north of England, which I was first the master planner and now we're the architects for the whole thing. And um, my client said, can you do a bar as a sort of early win? It's a bit like the visitor center in Cardiff, but, you know, with more, more fun because you can drink. So I started with the bar of words. And he came back, he said, no, no, no. What I want is Will's bar. I said, what do you mean by Will's bar? That's me. <laughs> said, yeah. In the contract, you will have to serve behind the bar for the first three days of opening. I said, oh, that sounds good. I like that. But I like to make a very simple bar, about 3,000 square feet, which is actually quite, quite the size for a bar. It would be a, 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 a sort of hut. This is the concept. I'll serve, and he said, I want everything Will in there. I, you, it's not just the building. It has to be the furniture the knives and forks, the glasses, any artwork, if that's what you want to do there, the menu, and the music. I think that's pretty good, actually. It's been very difficult organizing the fees on this. I, ne I never had to charge for music before. <laughs> but I like it. But I have, a, I have this notion. It should be a simple hut. It should be in timber, in plywood. And so everyone understands a pitch roof as a hut. And so you think when you go through the door, you know what's inside because you know what's inside because you've seen the inside, uh, the outside. But in this one, if you look on the top left, there is a different, there's a distortion with false perspective when you go on the inside, which is great because you're building a building within a building, and between, in the gap between the, the, the inevitable gap, you, that's where you can put the toilets, the kitchens, and all those other things that you need for a, for, for a bar. And you have a terrace for smoking. I'm a friend of the smoker, okay? I worry about people that smoke a lot. And you can cut holes, and there's, that's con there's containment, which is sort of scribble over the terrace to look after the smokers, because it's quite cold. Not as cold as Montreal, but Middlesbrough is quite cold and windy. Look, there's a simple diagram. 
This is perspective. So looking towards the end, I mean, these are quite, uh, this is what I'm working on right now, in part, one of the things. So the bar would just be a simple slit in the wall. You know, the temptation is to design the bar. You don't do that. Not in Middlesbrough, you don't. And the thing you also have to avoid in, in Middlesbrough in the north of England is what we call vertical drinking. You have to, so that people sit down. They drink less. If they stand up, they drink too much, and then they fall over, and then you have a problem. <laughs> okay? That's true. <laughs> and uh, so this is... Um, no vertical drinking. I can't quite, you know, the opposite of the opposite is, is horizontal drinking, and that's no good either. <laughs> but you can play with the light. And so within this thing has one side that can slide off in the, in the summer, which I think would be very nice. You, you introduce light, and there's some very special details that we're developing. And there's one table, which is also, look, there's the plan of the bar. But the table will break out, will break up. But it's one of those uh, puzzles, you know, where you can, you can carve it up in a certain way. And when you put it back, there's a bit missing. Have you ever come across that? So I like the idea that the actual management never gets quite to grips with this. Oh, shit. How much were we drinking last night? <laughs> Because in the summer it's nice to break it up and then you have more individual tables or you can have it all. I like the idea of everyone at one table. And of course the window on the far left is also a distorted perspective of coming into the bar. The artwork will be canvas and it will be padded. It's, it's a way, so the artwork is also to reduce the noise. There's too much noise in most bars. You, know, you can't have a proper conversation. That gives me a bit of a conundrum with the music and I haven't resolved that yet. But the food, it's called the no choice bar. Okay? There'll be one thing to eat each day of the week. And if you don't like it, you can go somewhere else. Simple as that. But I get to choose. Okay? Very good. So I've been trying to research local dishes you know, from, say, the 17th, 18th century. Do you know? I don't think they ate anything in the 17th and 18th century. I can't find anything, <laughs> which is a real, really authentic dish. And so this is, and I've been playing with the idea of cheap chairs, which are conversions of wheelchairs for cripples. Oh, sorry, and people who can't walk properly. And um, I don't know at the moment. Anyway, I'm working on that. I'm going to brush through Yonkers because we, I need to get to the end. That's my client. Here's the building. Just working on this. This is a, a cruise terminal in Den Haag. Which this, this, <coughs> the ink is hardly dry on this drawing before I left. But I like this. So all the land on the, in the sand dunes is new land. And we'll put housing on there and there's a hard edge, and then they have, they'll have space for up to three of the largest cruisers coming directly in. And then there's some housing, a new fishing harbour, and then the, obviously the, the barrage at the top is also new. The scale of this is, is really big, so that the, the main cruise terminal, which is the bit that sa stands in between the two boats, this is 600 metres long, just to give you an idea of the, of the scale of this. I like the Dutch. They're very mean. But I like them. This is the end of the cruise tunnel. It has houses, housing in it, and a hotel, as well as getting on and off boats. On top, although it's not illustrated here, is my sort of waving platform. You know, I like the idea that you can see your loved ones off as they disappear on this revolting cruise. <laughs> Smiling. <laughs> but it's the human side. But, and then elsewhere there will be more housing, some shopping. And for the first time I think we could build a brick building. I think that would be, it would be the right place to do brick. Plus mix with other things, a new marina. I think gives you a rough idea, a, a little shopping street, etc., etc. <coughs> but on the left you can see what I call the beach people. These are homes. There they are. Would you live there? 
Mm, you've obviously never been to Den Haag. It's really windy. But um, I like the atmosphere. I like the fact, and, and my client really likes these a lot. So you live on the beach. You have to leave your car, but there can be a shuttle service, electric shuttle service to your front door, and food delivery. So you live on the beach in something that's rather different. It's very nice there in the summer. But not, so good, not so good in the winter, I have to say. But they built some elsewhere in Den Haag. Uh, they have built some other dune dwellings. But it's a waste of time. The houses they built, it's fantastic. If you're in the house, you look out at the dunes ex precisely. And you only own the house. You don't own any land, just the house. But the houses that you could find in Arcasia <coughs> Avenue in Surbiton in London, I mean, why would you put, it doesn't respond to the place in any way, shape or form. But I think there's a whole story to tell about this place. Dubai. I'm going to just finish on this. Is that all right, Maka? Captain? This is Dubai. This is the creek. And I have two projects in Dubai. In fact, on next Tuesday, I'm going to Dubai. To see my client and hopefully to get another project. It's a ferry, t I have, well, I went for one ferry terminal and they gave me two. This is the first one. Okay. And saying, this is some of the work I was doing to inspire me what to do with the ferry terminal. It's very important, it's very nice to do this project in Dubai because it's putting what they need, which is infrastructure. They have no infrastructure, really. But now they're being put in, there are trains, metro, and the ferries, which are very important. And uh, I made this presentation, and this is it. Say, I want to minimize the air condition bit because actually the climate in Dubai in November, December, uh, January, February, and, and most of March is beautiful. 26 degrees, sunny, no rain. One, well, they have a little bit of rain in January. But that's okay, you have a roof here. But I said to them, because I was in competition, and I saw what the other architects had done, I said, I don't do that. Because no one in all the work that's going on in Dubai, and it's a crazy place, you have all these mad architects. But you'd never, the only two things you have here are strong sunlight and therefore strong shadows. I want to play with that. And they listened. And they, so they gave me, well, not this, just this project, but another one too. So this is the smaller of the two. So that's where it's a series of columns. Some are upside down and become some air-conditioned space because, to be honest, you do need that in, in uh, June, July, and August and most of September. But you can see as, as you track the sun or move past it, it becomes a very different place. And this sounds a little bit arrogant, but they've never seen anything like this before because most architects go with extreme forms, which mean nothing, absolutely nothing. And most people think I do extreme forms all the time. I don't, mainly I do boxes. Yeah? There's the context. And the other, uh, I don't have anything to point with, it. the other one is in this location, somewhat bigger, because it has a different set of ferries which are, which are larger my initial sketch. This is the moment of, uh, I like, you notice that there's a bottle of wine on the table <laughs> to my people and an ashtray uh, and an empty sheet of paper. You know, the, the beginnings of everything start with a blank sheet of paper, don't they? And that's, what I like, that's where the wine comes in because you can deliberately, sp I like the idea of the accident. You can spill the wine. There's something on the paper. It's a starting point. You know, for me, it's always fascinating. You can say anything you like, you can do anything you like, because nothing matters at this point. So you end up with your friends, uh, with the guys from the Bureau, and you're working away, and you end up with something like that. I like the drawing. Don't ask me exactly what it means, but I like the drawing. But from this drawing comes the beginnings of a notion. And from that, look, it's the Incredible Hulk. <laughs> That's wonderful. There's nothing in these gaps, but it's a rusty sunshade with holes, with 
elements which are on thin sticks, these, uh, which are actually gold, reflective gold. So in the wind, they move around a bit, deliberately. So it just catches the light in different ways. And inside are flowers. And they're the air, the air conditioned bits and the waiting areas and everything else. That's where you wait for your boat. Be quite nice, don't you think? Do you like that? I like I'm, I'm very excited about this project. All right, you don't like it. But we'll do something else. And the flowers come down into the water. Belsay Hall in Northumberland. I'm making a garden there. I don't really know what I'm doing yet, but I love the hall. It's completely empty. It's a really interesting place. It's a beautiful thing, built and designed by the owner after his grand tour of Italy. Because Italy is responsible for a lot of things, really, isn't it? Inadvertently, I'm looking at Mirko there, and also Madame over there. And, um, but it's wonderful. But then, you know, I think it was the great-grandson who went a bit crazy. He became a Scientologist or something like that. And the trust who owned it got very worried that he was going to give it away. And that, but they weren't in control because he was the eldest. Um, he actually he had inherited it, but there was a trust. So he left it, in, in the trust changed the rules and said, well, you can sell it to anyone, but no one will ever be allowed to put any furniture in it. That was very clever. So it's empty. Fantastic. It was used by the army during the war to house the troops. And it's just left, as, and it's a wonderful place. But this, got, this house, the stone, was made by quarrying, making a hole in the, in, in the area. So the, the commission is to make a garden within the garden. So this is one of my starting points here. I made a number of these the collages, really, quite big, five foot by four foot, something like that. And I've been there and I've chosen this place to put the garden. This is in the hole that made the house. Could be. Huh? I don't know. I'm working on this. These are the biggest... These leaves, I could sit on that leaf and I'd look quite small, okay? <laughs> Just to give you an idea of the scale. Here's the place. Look, you see, that there's my client in the coat on the right-hand side. She's very small. It's beautiful, isn't it? Don't you? I, it's a wonderful garden because it has a sort of story behind it. This is all in the hole. Maybe. Stars in my eyes. <laughs> Possibly. I'm going to stop at that point. Thank you very much for listening. Can you, can you take some questions? Yes. I'll say five minutes to some questions. Yes, of course. Okay, perhaps um, it's a little bit late, but perhaps if there are a few questions. Uh, quick question. Uh, what about the real world of project that you give you? Is it uh, any chance? Uh, I fear no. Um, Peter Gabriel is a dear friend of mine, and I like him very much. But in my experience um, with people from the, uh, let's say, the world of music who are well known, they. They have lots of ideas, lots of collaborations, but they really don't like to spend the money. No, no that's unfair. They don't like to take the risk. And uh, with Peter, with, the, um, with, 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 with WOMAD, which, the first one that he organized for world music, he lost a lot of money. And he's, been, he's very, very careful. I'd rather have him a friend than a disappointed client. I don't know if there are any other questions. I'm quite a nice guy, you don't have to worry. <laughs> <laughs> the people from Detroit, do you go to sleep? <laughs> They've been driving 10 hours, I can't believe it. I wouldn't, know, I wouldn't drive 10 hours to listen to me. I don't. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is another bar I'm doing where I was using the paintings in the studio. Here, to, uh, look at that, this is the aggressive bar lady. <laughs> <laughs> and use it to explore what the bar 
could be. Then I realized, I mean, the bar is going in the building in Manchester, which I've nearly finished, and um, I realized that the paintings are the bar. It's good. Isn't it? Look at that. I, I think I like this one. That's Amanda. I'm always in love with Amanda. Amanda has worked for me on and off since 1979. Would you believe that? She still looks great, doesn't she? Well, I think so. This is the cocktail bar. You'll notice the, the, um, the Manchester orange hair. There's a lot of orange hair in Manchester. So, one more question. Come on. Someone must have one question, then we go and get yeah. a drink. There's one. Oh, I show you. It's coming up. <laughs> It's a complicated project, which I, sh I said at the beginning, I started in 1997. First you had to raise the money and you had to do this and that. And uh, I should explain for those that you don't know, the public is actually a community arts centre. And you realise that the Arts Council of Great Britain, they want to give money to a community arts centre, but actually they don't really. Because opera is more understandable. I had to say that, because I think it's very interesting, this notion of this community arts centre, and there's a lady... Well, Sylvia King, who was in charge, and she dreamt the project up in the first place, long before I got involved. She's a fantastic lady. This is Croydon, by the way, another crap place, but, um, but really interesting <laughs> in other ways. Oh, that's Toronto. You know this one. I I'll get to the public in a minute. I know it's coming. Here's the public. So there it is, as a regeneration project in the middle of this shit place. <laughs> Lovely people, I have to say. And I worked a lot with the people. A simple box of delights. It is uh, outside. There are the toilets. No, the most important part, I think, of any building is the toilets. No, no, if you get the toilets right, maybe the rest of the building is okay. No get them wrong, there's no hope for the rest of the building. These toilets have no wall. Oh, I won't go into that. I don't have time now. And another shot of the toilets. And the other th rocky thing sticking out are the kitchens. You think there might be special things behind these objects, but they're the, the most normal things that stick out of, uh, out of the box. It's inside. It's all right? Do you like that? I'm not explaining it. It's also inside. This is the end of the art gallery, or as we're always known in our bureau, as the sock. <laughs> the art gallery is deliberately difficult to show any work in. So that artists, and there are some artists from either local, national, or international, some very well known people, we have, they can't, you can't say, you can't just curate a show and they come up with the same old stuff. They have to think about this space. The other gallery space is actually a ramp that goes on. And to install things on the ramp. It's like in Marseille. I did a 4% slope in the atrium of the Hôtel du Département. It's because when they have exhibitions in there, they can't just put a rotten old exhibition in there because it doesn't work. They have to think about it. I think that's another thing that I've learned over the years, that you as an architect can create a problem that other people have to solve when they work harder. And the result, I think, is better. So this is also in the building, looking down on part of the ramp. It's an oak floor. And these lily pads at the top is, where, is for the administration. So the people who are administering the building and working on projects and things can all, are always aware of the public down below. They're not divorced in, a separate, uh, in a separate offices. And that's somewhere else. On the weekend it opened, 10,000 people went. It's all right. This is actually only a few miles away in Walsall. Also in the black country, you know, where they speak funny like that. <laughs> Gone. 
you hold. 